Microbes are simple uh, life forms. Microbes are getting a lot of attention these days. In fact, let's take a minute and look at the person next to you. You think you're looking at a, an individual, a human, but you're actually looking at 39 trillion microbial cells. In fact, there's more microbial cells in your body than human cells. Those microbes are living with us in partnership. They're there to degrade the food that we eat. They produce compounds that impact our behavior and our cravings. And the natural microbes that live in our body actually help us resist pathogens or bad microbes. And when pathogens come in and disrupt our natural microbes, that's what causes many diseases. Our bodies are actually a complex set of interactions between microbes and human cells, an ecosystem, if you will, just like we see outside in the soils or in the oceans. And it's important to understand those interactions between the bad and good microbes to be able to predict and think about human health. Did you eat some cereal this morning for breakfast? Because microbes actually helped produce the nutrients in the soil that grew the food that you ate. Microbes improve crop yields. Did you just take a breath? Because half of the oxygen you breathed in came from microbes, and not just any microbes, my favorite microbes, marine microbes, <laughs> microbes in the oceans. And in fact, in the oceans, in those microbes are doing a lot of good things for us. I'm gonna focus on uh, carbon. This is the Earth's history over the last 400,000 years, plotting carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. If you look carefully at the numbers, you'll see it cycled for the last 400,000 years between 180 and 300 parts per million until 50 years ago. 50 years ago, we broke the 300 part per million barrier, and we did it fast and furious. In fact, last year, we broke the 400 part per million barrier. That's carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is a greenhouse gas. This has major implications and is destabilizing atmospheric uh, features. What does that have to do with the oceans and microbes in the oceans? Well, it turns out the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere rising so quickly is due to the fact that we as humans burn forests and fossil fuels and release about seven gigatons per year of carbon. Only four gigatons per year stay in the atmosphere. So we actually can thank the oceans for taking up three gigatons per year or about half of what we as humans put into the atmosphere. I'm gonna flag that most of that stays in the surface oceans it is important and impacted by the microbes in the surface oceans in ways we're only beginning to understand. And I'll also mention this really hurts the oceans. The oceans depend on carbon and carbon chemistry to actually buffer against changes in pH. We've successfully acidified globally the oceans. Luckily for us, the oceans have halved the rate at which we burn our planet up. Carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is a greenhouse gas causing huge temperature rises and major changes in atmospheric uh, weather patterns. But the oceans at least are taking half of the brunt for us. So you should thank the oceans and the ocean microbes for that. But viruses are also important. This is seawater stained with a DNA stain. Tiny dots are viruses and big dots are microbes. Hopefully you'll see there's about 10 times more small dots than big dots. And have any of you ever gone swimming and swallowed a mouthful of seawater? 50 million viruses came with that mouthful of seawater. Don't worry, these don't affect your human cells. They don't affect your human microbes. They're specialized for marine microbes. But they're really tough to get a handle on. We don't know a lot about the individual viruses out there because less than 1%, in fact, far less than 1% can be cultured. So getting them into the laboratory to study is difficult. And you'll see later, we rely a lot on sequence-based methods to look at that. But we do know from community measurements, these viruses play major roles. They kill about a third of microbes in the oceans per day. They move 10 to the 29th genes per day. Now that's a big number. Most of us can't even handle that number. But it means that microbes in the oceans are actually getting new skills and new techniques, new capabilities to do things because a virus gives them a new gene. And then there are these toxins that we often think of as microbial, shigatoxin, pertussis toxin, cholera toxin, diphtheratoxin, 
actually these are viral. It's the virus inside the microbial genome that's hiding in there that encodes the toxin gene. And when that virus gets upset, that's when the pandemic happens. So my group studies viruses of microbes, and in particular, viruses of microbes in the oceans. And we're interested in doing this for the reasons I talked about. We care about climate change, and we want to understand how the oceans and those ocean microbes and their viruses will impact carbon cycling and climate change. But I also want to just emphasize, we're studying viruses of microbes in complex communities. And there are other complex communities out there. What we do is a roadmap to study much less well-studied places, like the microbes in the soils or the microbes in us. So all the work I will show you while it's in the oceans can come back to any microbial dominated ecosystem. So our journey is going to start here on this sailboat. This isn't just any sailboat. This is the Tara. The Tara is a generously sized sailboat, but a very small research vessel. Now, a handful of scientists spent one month at a time over the course of three years sampling the global oceans, looking at organisms in the oceans from viruses to fish larvae. This is not the easiest work. You throw some bottles over the side, it's heavy, there's all kinds of big equipment, the sea's rolling, you pull the bottles up on the deck, and then you have to process it, and you're staring in microscopes, and you're filtering, and you're doing all this stuff that I get sort of sick thinking about in the lab, let alone on the, on the boat. But it's field work, and that's tough. It takes grit. So we move on. The other aspect of this work, or this Tara Ocean's global study, is the number of people it takes. It takes a village. And here I'm just showing a handful. These are the coordinators. There's greater than 200 scientists from 35 labs on 20 different disciplines involved in Tara Oceans. And I'm but one person here telling you specifically about the virus work. So we have this boat, the Tara. And she starts in, in France and sails around the world along her transect. She throws these bottles in the upper right off the side of the boat, collects seawater. And at each of these red dots, she has 24 to 48 hours to deeply sample these oceans. This is where people are doing the work I mentioned a minute ago, pulling water up, processing it, archiving it, even analyzing some of it. 24 to 48 hours on a rocking boat, trying to do some good science and get samples back home in good shape. That's not a normal oceanographic research vessel experience. So we all had to develop some new techniques, quantitative reproducible sampling techniques from viruses to fish larvae to be able to assay and do very good science systematically and globally. So we've got a boat. We've got three years. We've got scientists and we've got sampling. What are we going to learn? So if we look at viruses, it turns out when we sequence viral communities, Globally in the oceans, 90% of what we see is unknown. That's cool. It's new to science, but it's hard to talk about. That means I take a new sequence. 90% of them don't hit anything that's ever been seen. It's not in a database. The bad news is that means we're sitting on our front porch, looking out at the dark night, and all we can see is the 10% that's lit up by a tiny little street lamp on the corner. That's OK. I'm going to focus on the good news. We've actually near completely cataloged the global ocean viral uh, populations. This is a collector's curve showing you, as we add samples on the x-axis, how many new viral types or viral populations do we see? And you can see for the first few samples, we're seeing a lot of new stuff. And so that's a very steep curve. But for the last end of the samples, we're not seeing many new viruses. So that started to saturate. And we've now got a very robust catalog of viruses in the surface and deep oceans globally. I never thought we'd get there. This is important to everyone, because these viruses here that are pictured represent 1,000 known viruses. Most of these are in databases from cultures. And they're mostly medically related, which is important to study, but doesn't represent what's outside in the environment. In our project, in addition to the ocean's work, we also mined hidden viruses from publicly available microbial data sets, and we found a total of 28,000 new viruses. So we augmented databases 14-fold. Now that we know so much about the types that are there, what kind of science can we address? This first story will seem a little bit simple. 
This is the oceanographic transect again, and the numbers are each of those red stations where we stopped for 24 to 48 hours. And what you can see are arrows. We can use the, the sequence data we have as genetic tracers for virus, viruses flowing through the oceans. And when we layer on the major oceanographic currents, it's not surprising that viruses seem to flow in the same direction as currents. Good. We know viruses don't swim. It's good that they're riding the currents. But what was interesting and surprising were the Xs. Let me just show that again. Each station now has a number of Xs, and those Xs represent viruses sinking. Viruses shouldn't sink. They shouldn't sink. What's going on? The paradigm is bacteria and phytoplankton. These are the microbes and tiny plants in the ocean. When they're lysed by viruses, should blow up into small parts. And those small parts should be recycled in something we call the viral shunt. Those are great nutrients for the organisms living in the surface ocean to reuse. And if the organisms reuse them, then nothing should sink. It should all stay in the surface oceans. But what we're seeing suggests that viruses are sinking, which suggests viruses must be part of some sort of aggregate that could sink to the deep sea. So what if those small parts were actually sticky and stuck together and aggregated and became big parts? Those might sink and export. And this is where I come back to that beautiful 200 scientists consortium. Other scientists in that same group were studying carbon flux. Carbon flux is carbon that's produced in the surface waters that can sink to the deep sea. And we've actually been very fascinated with carbon flux in the oceans for over three decades. Because again, the oceans are pulling down that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and a sink for carbon. So here's a map of carbon flux determined by these fellow uh, colleagues in the consortium. And when we actually worked with them to uh, uh, answer a simple question, which organisms drive this carbon flux, it turns out viruses are the major players. If you layer all the different organism abundances, the maps of the different kinds of organisms we saw, and you mix in the carbon flux data, and you use computational approaches to understand which organisms best predict carbon flux, we saw that viruses predicted 79% of carbon flux. Now, I don't know how many ecologists there are in the room, but if you predict 79% of anything in ecology, that is a really robust finding. <laughs> it suggests that we might have a new paradigm where viruses aren't producing small stuff and aren't creating a viral shunt that recirculates in the surface oceans. Viruses may be creating sticky aggregates that grow and sink to the deep sea and export a lot of carbon. Now to us, that means that viruses are actually helping the oceans continue to remain a carbon sink. And that's important because we don't want to create the Earth Inferno, where we have CO2 creating an intensively greenhouse cycle that will make us warmer and warmer and destabilize the atmosphere. So what I've tried to share with you today is that there's this big ocean out there, and it's dynamic, and it's tough to sample on, and it's tough to work in. Um, <clears throat> but we actually have developed an incredible array of techniques in studying ocean viruses to be able to survey them quantitatively. We've augmented databases from 2,000 to 28,000 different viruses. And we've applied and developed big data approaches to understand really large data sets and get some biology and ecology out of them. And what I want to leave you with is to suggest, while we've done this in the oceans for reasons related to climate change and carbon cycling, these approaches are now entirely generalizable to studying viruses in any complex community. And that can be in soils, the oceans, or in your human body. Thank you. <laughs>